On this edition of Native Report, we travel to Madeline Island to learn about the Bilingual Signage Project. While on Madeline Island, we visit the Madeline Island Museum. We're people of this, this land and of this earth and of this water. And we meet Brian Bainbridge, chairman of the Redcliffe Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in northern Wisconsin. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Following the lead from communities located near Native Nations, the Town of La Pointe and the Apostle Islands Area Community Fund launched a bilingual sign project that incorporates the Ojibwe language on posted signs across Madeline Island. This is a project that bridges the past with the present. It is a beautiful summer day as the Madeline Island Ferry makes its way to the La Pointe Marina. Visitors may notice that many of the signs around the island have both the English and Ojibwe languages sharing the same space. And today we're going to find out more about the Bilingual Signage Project. Madeline Island is one of the most sacred places for us as Anishinaabe people here. This used to be one of the biggest centers, biggest population centers in the area. A lot of people lived here and for different reasons we began moving off of this island. I know of at least three different people that were helping to translate some of these signs here. I'm really happy to see that language here on these signs. Um, I haven't seen all the signs yet so I'm interested in going and reading them all. Um, I was asked to help translate one of the signs um, at the Inn on Madeline Island there. Madeline Island is a cultural and spiritual home of the Ojibwe and we thought it would be a great connection to the greater community, greater Shawamigan community, including Red Cliff and the Odena tribes. I am by no means an Ojibwe expert, so we used the translations that the town of La Pointe had used for their project with Nick Nelson, and then we contacted Grassroots Indigenous Multimedia out of um, Hayward, and we used a translator, Jordan Flada, and um, they were very helpful. And they helped write some copy for us that we have yet to post on why we're doing the Ojibwe sign project here on the island. It, it's an educational experience for everybody. The island has a year-round population of about 270, and in the summer months, tourists raise that number by several thousand on any given day. Project supporters hope that it inspires interest in the native history of the island. What a great eye-opening experience for the visitor. Uh, people visit things for a wide array of, of reasons and one of the latest things that we found is people want to know what really happened, where they are years ago from where they stand today. I think a lot of the interpretation uh, dealt with not the signs that say don't do this, but a more matter-of-fact way of saying here's the market, here's the church, here's the beach, don't jump in the water, it's too shallow. So I, th I think it's they're functional and uh, and, and a great sense of meaning is, is brought forth. We want people to enjoy that moment when they're here and get a sense of understanding. And if they want to take a step further, we have a wonderful museum. We have two neighboring uh, reservations. Uh, feel free to go visit those once you've visited here. It helps me and I think others connect to the past because the uh, Ojibwe and the native people were here hundreds of years before the European uh, fur traders and missionaries. I think it's, it's a connection to the past, it's a connection to the greater community, and I think it helps us understand where we came from and where the island came from. The town of La Pointe is where the 1854 treaty between the Lake Superior Chippewa and the federal government was signed, 
and the island is still used by local native communities for ceremony. One of the most sacred spots is the Ojibwe Cemetery. I'm very happy to see that. Uh, the sun's in my eyes, so you might not be able to see my smile, but inside I'm smiling pretty big. And um, it really makes me feel good to see that language here. And I just wish that there would be more, more history included with those signages because there are a lot of stories about this area. Well, I really truly wish that when people read these signs here in the Anishinaabe language, they ask what those words mean. And when they start thinking about what those words mean, I wish that they would ask, I wonder why they chose that word. And as they begin thinking about that language, I hope they start asking, why was this place so important in the history of the Anishinaabe people? And then I hope they go and start finding those answers. It's kind of sad for me that a lot of people don't know the history of this island, the history of the Anishinaabe people who were here first in our migration journey and all that has happened to us, you know. So as these signs show up here about Anishinaabe language and as more people come to visit here, you know, I really hope that they start asking those questions about that history of the, the Madeline Island here, Maningwana Kaningmanis. Even the name Maningwana Kaningmanis has a certain meaning. And as a teacher, I would like people to go out and look for that meaning themselves. It was, um, told to us a long time ago that all this information would be set on the side of the trail for us. And with my generation, I believe that we're picking those things up and asking about those and wondering why they are there. We begin when an egg meets a sperm. Neither are complete cells because they only have half the genetic material needed to form a single cell. This cell divides into two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, and so on. At some point, they differentiate into lung cells, liver cells, colon cells, and all the other cells in our bodies. Once a structure becomes so big, it stops growing and has defined edges. Controls allow cells to differentiate, to divide, and stop growing at a certain stage. Mechanisms kick in for cell repair or for cells to destroy themselves as they become abnormal. Cells are small. For instance, there are approximately 25 million red blood cells in a single teaspoon of blood. Cancer can start in any part of the body or even the blood itself. This happens when the controls in a cell are disrupted for some reason. A single cancer cell in the lung, breast, prostate, colon, or any other tissue in the body divides into two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128. Cancers can grow and displace or invade structures nearby where they can erode into a lymphatic vessel or a blood vessel, and then they're on the freeway. A few cells can travel to a distant part of the body and begin to grow. Cancer that has traveled is said to have metastasized and these are very hard to find when they first start. The cancer is still the original cancer, even if it is in a different place. For instance, prostate cancer that is metastasized to bone is still prostate cancer. Some cancers spread slowly and some spread very quickly. Staging means determining how far cancer has spread. The most common treatment options for cancer are surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Surgery can be used if cancer is limited to a single site. Radiation can shrink tumors when they can't easily be accessed by surgery. Chemotherapy is used to stop rapidly dividing cells, and some of the most common side effects happen because of that. Hair cells are rapidly dividing and are targeted because of that, so hair loss is common with chemotherapy. Think of this. We replace a layer of cells in the digestive system from our, our lips to our rectum every three days, so chemotherapy-connected stomach and intestinal problems are common as are anemia and immune cell issues because we're constantly creating new blood cells. So what are your cancer risks? Smoking is a big risk for many types of cancer. There are other risk factors for developing specific types of cancers. Some of those come down to just age. That's why you should talk to your doctor about cancer screening. We'll discuss specific screenings in another segment. 
many people are cancer survivors that have been treated successfully for their cancers and go on to live full and productive lives. Prevention and screening are keys to success. I'm Dr. Arnie Vainio. Don't forget, call an elder. The Madeline Island Museum documents the rich cultural history of the island through exhibits and programs that explore three centuries of island life. Join us now as we tour the main exhibit that showcases powwow traditions of the past and the present in northern Wisconsin. The Madeline Island Museum opened its doors in 1958. It started very small. Originally four log structures laid end to end with its original intention of telling a local story. It's a great example of, of a mid 20th century kind of antique version of museology of how museums are done. Uh, it was founded in the 1950s by Bella and Leo Kapser who were summer residents on Madeline Island. Uh, they were from St. Paul, Minnesota and they decided that they could do something for the community. They loved Madeline Island, thought that they could do something, give something back, and, and their idea was to create a local historical museum. As they got into it and began working with, with other folks on the island, uh, they realized that the story was not just about Madeline Island, that it was Madeline Island, Apostle Islands, Lake Superior, that it, it, it broadened as the more they thought about it. Usually you just get a whole bunch of stuff, you put it in a building, it, it's a lot of family history, what I, what I call the begats. Uh, and, but this was different. This was get, coming up with a comprehensive narrative and then figuring out a way to flesh out that story with objects. And Leo collected to tell the story, which was the history uh, pre-contact, before Europeans came, up through early 20th century. And it encompassed Ojibwe life, uh, the coming of the fur trade, French and British arrival, 19th century trades, and the arrival of Scandinavian immigrants right up through early 20th century, and the coming of what, what we refer today as summer cottagers, uh, the birth of the tourism industry that we, that we have today. And that was their vision. The museum was run as a nonprofit for about a decade, and then in 1969, the property was handed over to the Wisconsin Historical Society. In 1990, it was decided to expand from the original structure to the museum of today with changing exhibits and other amenities. The gallery we're sitting in now is the Capser Gallery, uh, which is part of the new building that opened in 1991. So we have the original museum preserved essentially the way it was in 1958 and the brand new building where we can do changing exhibits. And oftentimes we'll pull an object from the original museum and feature it in an exhibit in this gallery. So the, uh, the history of powwows, uh, which is the exhibit we have this year, actually features a few objects that typically would be in the original museum in their original location. And when you pull them out, it's like separating a tree from the forest. You can actually see the thing in a different context and it, it begins to reveal to you a, a different story than, than when it's on display in that original space. Tell me a little bit about the exhibit that we're seeing here right now. Well, our new exhibit this summer is on the history of uh, Indian powwows. And it started um, as a small exhibit at the State Museum in Madison uh, in the fall of 2014. And I saw the exhibit down there and I thought that it was, it was pretty good and if we um, brought it up here to Madeline Island and then, and then added uh, some complementary material that fleshed out the storyline. So it gave it more local resonance uh, that we'd have, a, we'd have a good summer exhibit. So we added um, stories about, for example, the Apostle Islands uh, Indian pageant that was held in, in Bayfield and Redcliffe back in the 19, late 1920s and early 30s. We found some remarkable photos taken over at Bad River in the 1930s by an Ashland photographer that show some kind of powwow-like activity over there. It's, it's very vague on what was actually going on that, at that time, but the, the photos are, are riveting and they take us back in time and show us some really interesting uh, things about, about Bad River at the time. 
And so the intention was to show this continuity of that cultural tradition. Historical photographs complement contemporary images, moments frozen in time from different eras connected by a common thread of tradition. On opening day, one of the young ladies in one of Mike's photographs uh, came to the museum to see her picture on the wall with her family. And having Mike's photographs here did exactly what we wanted it to do, which was to make the exhibit relevant to people who are involved in pow powwow traditions today. It's accomplishing what we intended it to do, which was to bring a lot of different people together to get us sort of in some insight in, into this uh, really wonderful tradition. The two pieces that are in here that really resonate with me uh, are, are, one of them is a, is a beaded dress, and the other one is a beaded uh, loincloth. And it appears that these two objects are being worn by individuals in these photographs. We're one of 12 historic sites that are, that are owned and operated by the Wisconsin Historical Society. And those historic sites that we have, those museums, they're intended to give as much of the breadth of the human history of Wisconsin and the region as possible. Um, and m this one is the only one that is really charged with telling um, a, a Native American perspective. We're the ones that are positioned in the place to tell that story. Now the Madeline Island regional story is, is, is broad, so there's all kinds of other things that come in and out of it. Um, but the Ojibwe component is, has become uh, more important over the years and is a, is a significant part of what we do today. The significance of the island, the Apostle Islands, Lake Superior by extension to the Ojibwe people in particular. Um, I use the analogy, Madeline Island is to the Ojibwe what the Vatican is to Catholics. And immediately our visitors understand that. They understand that this is a, this is a profoundly sacred place for native peoples. We all have stories to tell about who we are and where we came from. And even if we weren't listening directly when our grandparents were sitting around talking or when our parents were visiting with family members or friends, I think those stories sink in when we hear them almost subconsciously. Uh, sometimes I think we have cell memory um, and recognize stories or remember stories. And I also think that having a direct connection to the land provides us with stories and inspiration. And all of that um, means that we have to sit still sometimes and just listen. So if I had to give advice to people who want to pursue some form of art, whether it's writing song lyrics, um, writing music, um, creating art quilts or paintings, doing quill work or traditional beadwork, any form of traditional art, um, that means that we have to be still and listen and listen well. The demands of being a tribal council member are many and are very different than those of the past. Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Chairman Brian Bainbridge meets the day-to-day -day challenges by adhering to the teachings of his ancestors and the advice from his elders. It is here on these shores of northern Wisconsin, the people of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa have called home for generations. They are one of 11 Native nations in Wisconsin. Well, our reservation is uh, a little over 14,000 acres. Uh, you know, it's pretty small, but it's uh, uh, the location where we're at is 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 a real key thing to uh, 
a red cliff. Uh, it's on the most northern tip of Wisconsin, right on the shores of Lake Superior, uh, right adjacent to the islands. Uh, you just get in the lake, put your canoe in, put your powerboat in, whatever you got. Uh, minutes you're, you're to uh, uh, one of the many islands. We are the largest employer in, in Bayfield County and we are the only reservation in, in Bayfield County. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're small. Uh, total we have, uh, we're going about almost 7,000 members. Uh, but on the reservation, we're, we're having more and more people come home and now we're from anywhere from uh, 14 to 1,700 people that, that live on the reservation. Being a tribal leader of a native nation is a big job. Chairman Bainbridge keeps in mind the advice of his elders, and he finds inspiration from those who have gone before him as he and the tribal council deal with day-to-day -day business. We were always taught to uh, at least try to do things in the, in the, in the right way. You know, it, it took me uh, probably 30 years to figure it out of of really what uh of what respect really totally meant you know always knowing uh respecting so respecting your elders but it it you it, it always goes beyond that it's respecting everybody when they say you have to lead by example i mean it's just that the power comes when uh i can help our community and do things uh in that way because you know it, it, that's who we have to answer to you know our community you know and and our ancestors our elders that are here and the ones that have passed and that that have that led us to this place where you know I can sit here today along with our our other uh, elected leaders I just think of the stories that I heard you know as uh, especially at my my grandpa he was he was chairman he was vice chairman when it comes to uh, inspiration or, or where, what makes me do what I do, you know, it, it goes back not only to my grandfather, but, you know, all our other previous leaders. You know, we all have to work with what we got. And I want to make uh, positive change. I want to make sure that our, our people here in Redcliffe uh, are taken care of you know, uh, with an understanding that, you know, we may never have uh, the riches as uh, a large bank account, but to, to always think of the riches that we do have with our, our natural resources, our, our fishing, uh, everything around our land, you know, we're, with that, where our location is, we're, uh, we're the wealthiest tribe in the nation. As a councilman, Chairman Bainbridge helped establish Frog Bay Tribal National Park. And now as chairman, he wants to keep the band's progress moving forward on many levels. We're doing things here, uh, especially with our uh, early childhood center. We're immersing our, our kids with, uh, with the language. So we'll have it uh, for generations on. For me, that is, is being successful. And um, if I can accomplish that in uh, the time that I'm here, you know, I'll be happy. We can have our kids educated. We can take care of our elders. Uh, we can uh, keep our youth uh, away from the, the drug problems that, that are ever encroaching uh, in our small territories. Um, always be able to have uh, our natural resources to, to depend on, as we did for many, many years. This mining issue, it, uh, that's a big one, and uh, there's things that the, the governor thinks is, are right, and there's things that we know aren't right. So, you know, it's uh, just a, one of the things that we have to unfortunately have to deal with.
we'll do whatever it takes uh, to make sure um, whoever comes with this threat of, of pollution or destruction or, or you know, whatever it may be, that uh, we'll always be there. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation.